Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and it's good to see you on this fine morning. Uh, we usually do our recordings in weekday evenings. Weekday evenings. Coffee hasn't kicked in yet. But we're recording in the morning today, which is kind of fun, so we'll see if that changes the energy <laughs> level of our conversation at all. But today we're talking about Ruth. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about the Christmasiness of Ruth, the love story, the biblical imagery, the foreshadowing, the orchestration of events to bring us the Messiah. Um, and today we're, we're going to look at sort of the societal background of Ruth, the practice of gleaning, immigration and welfare policy, see if we can determine some principles of justice and compassion and things like that. To borrow a phrase. To borrow a phrase. Yeah. What does a compassionate society really look like? <laughs> Isn't it where we just accept everybody and pay for whatever they want? You know, that doesn't actually sound that compassionate to me. <laughs> it's because you're a product of a materialistic economic society, but you won't learn. <laughs> <sighs> You know, there was a time in 1984, Brave New World of Fahrenheit 451 sounded like fairy tales. <laughs> yeah. We moved them recently uh, off of the fiction show. <laughs> oh, well, jumping in then, we've, if you were here last week, you, you've heard maybe for the umpteenth time the story of Ruth, but something that many Christians aren't quite familiar with because they haven't read the Old Testament very much is this the whole economic socioeconomic background of the story here is a foreigner an immigrant coming into Israel now is she an immigrant well yes and no technically she's married or was married to an Israelite which should count for some kind of citizenship so she's like a green card holder she's like a green card holder but people will, the temptation will be to see her as an outsider. Her accent will be different. Oh, I don't know exactly the nature of Moabite's language. I don't think anybody else does either. But her um, great great ancestor, 400 years earlier, had been Lot, who spoke Hebrew after a fashion. But there were no doubt some Canaanite influences. So probably she didn't. The Hebrew she spoke would be accented and a little not colloquial, be rather formal and, and odd at times. She would dress differently, wear makeup differently. There would be customs and such that that would not make sense to her initially. And, and in that sense, she experienced a lot of things that immigrants to the United States today experience, trying to communicate with people speaking really fast in idioms they don't understand. <laughs> and, and and on top of that, the nation she came from, Moab, although distantly related to Abraham, had not been nice to Israel when Israel had come out of Egypt some 300 years earlier, depending on where this is set exactly. It may have been probably like 150. Israel had come to the borders of Moab and asked for bread and been denied. Which makes the whole story ironic that mm -hmm. Naomi and her family fled Bethlehem, the house of bread, to go to Moab, which had always denied them bread. You know, so there's all that. Mm -hmm. But Moab had also had a hand in that whole thing of um, hiring Balak to curse them, or Balaam to curse them. And at some point, possibly just before this, this may explain the famine, Moab had invaded Israel. Remember the whole story of um, Ehud. So. Ruth had a lot going against her, even if uh, officially she was the widow of an Israelite. Perceptions could have been very, very negative here. But there were no immigration restrictions in Israel. There's nothing in the law about fencing out people who want to come. Now, there are some things that made it more complicated when we can talk about it in a bit. But simply coming in and even settling down in and of itself was not forbidden, was not illegal. In fact, the Bible assumes throughout that if God's people are walking with him faithfully, if they're keeping covenant, that Israel will be a place of justice and peace, uh, agricultural blessing, 
opportunity. It will be a place people will come, and, and many will come for the name of the Lord your God, Moses says. Mm -hmm. There's, there was the mixed multitude even coming out of Egypt yeah. from the very beginning, and he's constantly referring to the stranger that is among you. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it, it was a, an assumption <clears throat> that this would happen. And I'm, I'm going to say this now, so maybe you can help me remember later. The, the Puritan idea of a city on a hill factors into this to some extent, primarily as it influenced American foreign policy later, not so much as the Puritans themselves understood the idea, <laughs> right. which is you know two different things. But... Ideas are not responsible for what people do to them as time passes. <laughs> so, anyway, so that, that's Ruth is coming, and the welfare policies of Israel were wide open to immigrants. And at first, that sounds anti libertarian, anti conservative, and terribly frightening to a lot of well, Americans. Well, it's very libertarian. Yeah. <laughs> because the welfare policies amounted to, yeah, you're invited to go out and work real hard. <laughs> <laughs> and keep whatever you have, but we're not paying you anything. <laughs> it's your own they, time you're spending. It's your time. You the one the one thing that was required by the law, but not necessarily enforced by the state, although the church might have enforced it, was this practice of gleaning that we're going to look at here in a second. Uh, the opportunity to go into the field of another after they were done with their first round of harvesting. You didn't get to go in in the middle. It wasn't your field. You couldn't just walk in whenever you well, actually you could, but you couldn't walk in with <laughs> harvesting tools. You couldn't you had, bring your tractor with you. You, you couldn't bring your tractor, yeah. nor could you even bring, uh, say, uh, a basket until the harvesting was done. Uh, one of the odd details of the law that recognizes God's sovereignty over human ownership is since it's God's fields, God says, and if you're walking through and it's an apple orchard and you want to grab an apple eat as you go, that's perfectly fine. And we have an example when um, the Pharisees accused the disciples of working on the Sabbath, they were walking through wheat or barley fields and grabbing a snack and threshing. And no one said, hey, that's theft. Everyone knew that was perfectly fine. You just couldn't put it in your pockets or put it in a basket or something. So there was that. Nobody <laughs> needed to starve in Israel. All you had to do was take a really long walk through fields that where they were green to harvest or brown to harvest, whatever the proper color would be. But aside from that, gleaning was something that happened when the initial harvester was done. God required that uh, the owner of the field not go back and get every last piece. And if they forgot something out there, leave it. So this is an intrusion on natural property, property rights, but it's ordained by God, not by the state. And there is no evidence that the state had any authority to enforce it. God enforced it. You want to go on having good harvests? It's kind of like the tithe. <laughs> you want you, you want God to, to bless you? You better walk with him. You better imitate your heavenly father who does good to all and makes his son to rise on the just and the unjust and sends rain, rain upon all. And so the church might have had some hand of enforcing it if there was a consistent abuse and refusal. But short of that... It was mostly a matter between the employ or the uh, landowner and God, which meant that the landowner retained the, enough titles to say, you, but not you. You're a troublemaker. Get out. You're the deserving poor. You can come in. We'll talk about the deserving poor and my fair lady and such. Mm -hmm. But let me, let me go ahead and read two of the passages where the leading laws show up. There are one or two more, but this should do it. This is from Leviticus 19. Verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt gather every grape of the vineyard, and thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And then from Deuteronomy 24, verse 19, when thou cuttest down thy harvest in the field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, and for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. That is to say, that is one of the reasons for which he commands them and one that would should resonate with them. You were slaves. You were poor. You were destitute. 
There were times when it was hard to eke out a living. You should understand and you should be willing to open your hand to these people who need food. And the three categories keep showing up. The stranger, that would be the foreign immigrant, the fatherless, orphans, and the widow, a woman who's lost her husband and may have no family to support her, although the first responsibility would fall to the family. Widows shouldn't have to be out there if they have family members, but not everyone did. Not all family members are godly. So there's the basic the basic principles of gleaning. That means you go out and do what's undone, right? I also wanted to just point out, uh, looking forward, there's a lot of gospel representation in that kind of setup. Not mm-hmm. only for the believer, where uh, it's an expression of trusting God that he's going to bring enough provision that you will be able to provide for yourself and, and make a profit by selling what you, what you um, I almost used the word glean, uh, what you harvest mm-hmm. in the first pass. Mm-hmm. Without having you can, to pick up every little last thing, you're going to be okay? Yeah, exactly. God, the, God will provide for you enough mm-hmm. that you can also bless others by leaving behind the, the, the rest. Um, but then also the the fact that it it's it's kind of pointing, I, I think, in picture to the overflowing blessing that mm-hmm. the new covenant brings, where in picture form, it's basically saying, look, we bless people so much that the like it overflows into the destitute as well. And also, if you're thinking of yourself in this kind of simul justus et peccator kind of mindset. That means you are benefiting from the overflow of the gospel mm-hmm. because you're fatherless uh, mm. with, without, without, apart from, from God, obviously. You're without support. You're, you're a widow in, in typology anyway. Yeah, Adam and, doesn't do anything for us as our yeah. father. <laughs> exactly. And you are a stranger to God apart from God bringing you into his family. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Let me add to that. <laughs> now that you've opened the door. Wow. <laughs> By the way, there was a phrase in there I honestly did not get. Was Simil used to set the cutter? Yeah. That one? Uh, at oh. the same time, sinner and saint. That's saint Martin Luther's sinner. phrase. Yeah. Okay. I feel uneducated. Thank you. Um, <laughs> when, once you slowed it down, I might have been able to get to Latin, but I, I, I honestly have not heard that before. But of course, it's a glorious truth. Uh, one of uh, our visiting pastor, uh, I think it was last week or maybe the week before, greeted us, hello, sinners. Everyone said, hello. <laughs> he said, hello, saints. And everyone said, hello. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Oh, I, I had one classmate in, in a Greek seminar in college where the professor, Dr. Eric Hutchinson, if you're listening, he came in and said, hello, weirdos. <laughs> and this student dropped the class immediately. <laughs> <He's> like, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> oh, come it was weird. on. We're all weird. All right. Anyway, let me let me take Brian's beautiful, wonderful, accurate analogy or or extrapolation from the text. Because the section I just read, you were bondmen. Well, let's consider what that means. <laughs> we were in bondage to sin and death. And that's not something we're imposing on the text. That's something God draws out from one end of scripture to another. The land of Egypt, the house of bondage. I've delivered you. I redeemed you. The language of redemption. So as those who have been redeemed from sin. Brought out through the waters even. Yes. We should be willing, joyfully willing to share, first of all, that very redemption with people. Those overflowing gospel blessings. And... And, and in addition, or at the same time, because it's not truly an addition, it's just an extension, um, the the earthly blessings that attend kingdom life, God, everything Brian just said, God provides for us so abundantly on all levels, both what we often call spiritual and that which we often call material, but for the whole man, that we should be more than willing to share those. And, and that's exactly what Jesus is saying in the passage I alluded to earlier, love your love your enemy. Why? Because God does. Be like your heavenly father. He's good. He was good to us when we were his enemies, when we were children of wrath, even as others. And so this overflowing abundance should, this gospel abundance, let's keep the focus there, not just mm-hmm. common grace, whatever that is, but <laughs> this uh, this special grace overflowing through God's people into the surrounding culture uh, should move us 
to want to help people, not because of common humanity exactly, although that's part of it because we're all the image of God, but because we are beggars who have found food, telling other beggars how to find food. And if we're willing to do that, we can't, and we can't actually reach into our larder and pull out a real piece of bread and hand it to someone who's starving. There's nothing wrong with us. Yeah. See the book of James. Yeah, exactly. See the book of James. Be ye warmed and filled. Yes, yeah, Snoopy, be ye warmed and filled. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. <laughs> Snoopy's still shuddering in the snow. It's, it's easy to be like that. And we, and we look at the, um, and we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's fine. Um, well, we, we're getting ahead of ourselves by talking about the heart of the issue. Because if yeah. <laughs> we start talking about immigration and welfare without talking about the gospel, we're going to end up in neoconservatism yeah, land. Yeah, and, or we'll end up having to backtrack and fill Let's not up. do that. Yeah, yeah let's, let's, not. Let, let's not do that. So, um, No, on second thought, let's not go to neoconservatism <laughs> land. It's a silly place. <laughs> and that was wonderful. And in the process, I forgot exactly what I was going to say next. But we're talking about... Um, I mentioned our common humanity, we're, we're all made in the image of God. And because uh, the, the figure that we use, and I just mentioned it, the gospel or the evangelism is beggars telling other beggars where to find food. And that has to be key for us. There needs to be at the heart of, of, of a Christian welfare theology, the gospel itself. If we don't start with the gospel, we end off we end up off track into some kind of conservative or libertarian plan for the economy ideology. I, yeah, and and then we would have to try to backtrack and undo it. So it, it is it is good, and again, I really appreciate Brian that you brought that up when you did because it's not in the original original notes I made. Uh, shame on me because I'm, now I'm tempted to go back and rewrite them. <laughs> uh, it, it is basic that we are talking about God's goodness to us in the gospel as it ought to overflow to those about us. And the, the temptation here, as elsewhere, is when God says, do this and I will bless you. Oh, do this and live. No, that's not what it means. <laughs> context, context, context. Uh, the context is God's overwhelming grace to Israel. You know, be like your father in heaven, what Jesus tells us. Sermon on the Mount is not law in that sense. It is, the, it is kingdom life for those are, who are already Jesus' disciples. It is what it means to be in that circle of blessing. If you are blessed of God, if the Holy Spirit is at work in you, you will want to imitate your father. These are the kind of things you will be doing. So when Israel was at her best, when God was at work, when she was faithfully following her Lord, when she was believing the promise of Messiah, Israel would be a wonderful place to live for anybody. And thus the immigration and thus the gleaning laws, a very practical way for landowners, uh, farmers to say, God has been good to me, come and share the bounty. Uh, and again, an echo, an extension of gospel living. But with this, there's still the, there, there's still the thou shalt not steal and the, and the very principle of stewardship. The farmer owns under God the land and he's responsible to see that it's not abused and the people working on it are not abused. So you have the troublemaker who comes in and tries to, to harass the ladies who are working or tries to grab their stuff. No, you kick him out. There's, there's, in that sense, and I think maybe this is where I was trying to go earlier, um, the New Testament requires, if, if one will not work, neither shall he eat. That's the basic principle, and but it is easy in our... Uh, we, what we pretend is godly materialism, <laughs> covenant living, do this and live. Okay, well, that says that there's this guy in the street. He's obviously not working. I should not give him anything ever. And if you do, you're an idiot. You're only perpetuating his uh, his poor work ethic. And that, that's not what that's saying. No. It's saying you should, you should not put him on permanent welfare in your church and, and require nothing of him. It doesn't mean that you can't take a water bottle and hand it to the guy who's standing out there sweating to death and say, here, have this, or even reach over the what's left of your hamburger from McDonald's and say, not very nutritious, but maybe you'll like it. There's there's nothing in scripture that forbids those kind of things. I, I, I know people who, you know, that guy is just faking it. Well, he may well be, but you know, I don't know that. And God's not going to curse me because I was generous. <laughs> how many how how generous is God to people who he knows actively hate him? 
<laughs> and yet he keeps doing good things for them, for Jesus, for the broader um, growth and spread of the kingdom and its, its effects beyond the moment. So as we look at this, the farmer has to consider these kind of things. Uh, I need I need my land to be safe when people are gleaning, so some people can't come. Some, but some questionable people I may let in if I can keep an eye on them because you know I got a soft spot. God's convicting me about this or whatever. It, it's easy to turn it into a bureaucratic checklist kind of mentality, where once you've once you've checked all the boxes and met all the the qualifications, then you can go in, then you can do this, then we'll weigh it on the way out to make sure you have your fair share. And and, and eventually it turns into, you've done the boxes, you've done the checking, okay, go with whatever, and he drives out a truck or two because we forgot something in our regulations and they get abused. And so this, the thing about gleaning is it is done right. It is inevitably personal. It's the farmer's land. He's not going to want just anybody on it. He's going to want to know what's going on there. Because it is his stewardship. It is his responsibility. So that's some of what goes in here. It is not a government-run or state-run welfare system. It is, in some sense, a free choice of those who have uh, farmlands. Uh, the farmer is not freed from all responsibility. In fact, it become, he, he's forced to a greater responsibility because it is his land. He's he is responsible for what happens. So he's got to keep an eye on who comes in and who goes out, who he doesn't let in. He needs to know names. He needs to know background. And, and I've just been through the uh, formal uh, elders at the gate checking point. See my card. It's green and clear. And it looks like it's been erased a little. I spilled some butter on it. Okay, you can come in. And you, do, you had to actually know the guy. Well, that's just old Sam, you know, he's, he could work harder, but he's, he'll work for what he gets here. That guy, yeah, he's trouble. Tell him, tell him to leave. Mm -hmm. and if you need help, I'll help you make him leave. It's uh, kind of well, funny. I mean, I've seen in the swing dance community, I haven't been doing much swing dancing lately, but back when I went to a lot of workshops and things, um, there was one about organizing your scene and sort of the pedagogical side of it. And one of the points is, this is a social thing. You will have people there who are there to be creepy. Part of your job as running the scene is to boot the creeper out of the place. Yeah. And it's just, it's kind of ironic to me because a lot of the people who are, I guess you would say, high up in the swing dance world are very leftist. Mm. Um, so they see the necessity of booting the creeper from their own scene where they have people to protect um, but they don't necessarily see the necessity of it on the level of who's allowed in our community as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of ironic. Also, yeah. when you take this form of welfare and basically turn it into a landowner directed way of doing things, you also avoid the propensity of governmental oversight. Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's, Basically, the principle that the the closer to home things are being run, the less likely there is for abuse, oversight, um, misappropriation of funds, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and in that case, in that sense, limited sense of the word, it's a very libertarian type of setup for welfare, where you know you still have the social pressure, more or yeah. less, of a of a society that's like. Jim's not letting people glean from his fields. He's kind of a jerk. Yeah. You know. Um, and, and your pastor may come and talk to you about that. You know, this, this is what God yeah. did for Israel. You need to remember this. Yeah. And um, but it but it's also good because then like instead of somebody just being on the dole for government cheese, whatever, mm -hmm. I think that's a fun way of phrasing it anyway. <laughs> um, there's also a potential for them to actually grow and have character change. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, actually, it sounds uncaring to say that it's a good thing for someone to suffer for their poor character traits, but it actually <laughs> is because it might help them become better characters. <laughs> yeah. It's also, it's not just, you know, the power of hard work to change people. It's forcing them into contact with other members of the community who can share the gospel, which will actually change their hearts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where the, it's, it's an opportunity for God's spirit to work through circumstances. It's a lot like spanking your, your, your kid whom you love. The spanking does not generate new character, but the spanking gets the kid's attention. Mm -hmm. 
And he realizes, yeah, no, this is not a fun path. Uh, there's a passage in Jeremiah, in one of the early chapters, I, I don't remember exactly where, where God tells Israel, taste the bitterness of your sins. Look, look at your wickedness. See that it is indeed a bitter thing that you've forsaken the living God. An unconverted soul can understand the bitterness, the, the horrible situation, the pain that sin has brought him to. Now, that does not mean he will convert. It just means he knows this stinks. I've done something wrong. I made a mistake somewhere, just like a spanking. Okay, that was not a good idea. I don't think I really want to do that again, but that's short, that's short of a heart change. But as somebody says, if you're out there watching uh, the owner and you're working beside a lot of people who actually want to be out there because they don't want to hand out, they want to provide for themselves, they want the self-respect of knowing that what they brought home was not a handout. It was something they worked hard for. Because gleaning is hard work. It's much harder than, than the first round of, of harvesting. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an opportunity for character change to happen through the gospel. And even in some outward forms for some. Okay, just putting two to two together. I want to get out of here. I better start working a little harder. Life goes better when I do my job. Yeah, and it's that's hardly saving, but it's something. And again, the Bible does say, if any should not work, neither should they eat. And this is that being put into application in the Old Covenant. It does, you know, there, there's more to the welfare system, but we, we probably should address it. Well, let's just address it now just to get it out of the way. Um, other things, uh, the mandatory, and again, mandatory meaning not state enforced, but God enforced principle that if your brother, neighbor, fellow Israelite, even possibly the, the, the God fear of the stranger in your midst, is really poor and comes and asks for a loan, uh, assuming that his character is good, you're supposed to give it and you're supposed to give it without grudging and you're supposed to give even if it hurts a little bit. And without interest. And without interest. Oh, thank you. Interest-free, absolutely. And you've got six years. He's got six years to pay it back, six years to collect on it. And if he doesn't, then you're supposed to forgive it. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Now, again, since it's not government enforced, it does become in some regard a matter of personal discretion. Is this, is this guy poor because of illness, because of accident, because of fire, flood, or blood? Uh, or has he simply been lazy for a long time? Okay, maybe he's been lazy for a long time, but do I see a change in character and a real rededication to try to make things right? Or simply... This guy's a jerk. He's he's a lazy good for nothing, but he has the sweetest, most wonderful wife and, and really cool children, and I want to help them. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take a chance. But that puts it back in, in the level, again, of personal discretion, personal faith, and one's own walk with the Lord as to what God requires of you here now. And no one else gets to tell you what that is. Mm. Uh, again, if, you're, if your pastor and elders see a consistent Scrooge-like tendency to <laughs> never help anybody, they probably should talk to you. And under certain circumstances, some kind of, of church discipline might be in order, but that's going to be extreme. Yeah. Good stewardship uh, does not trump this principle of helping your neighbor. It's, it's not as though you are obliged to do the thing that is the best financial decision numbers wise. It's like you have seven years after that. It doesn't matter. God, <laughs> Get again, it through your head and your heart that it does not it matter. matter. God will take care of it and God will mm -hmm. reward you on every level that he knows to be appropriate and necessary to your needs. And it may not be that you'll get it all back or you get it all back tenfold or some nonsense like that. This is not a name it and claim it, health and wealth kind of gospel. This is simply the real gospel that says God's been good to you, be good to other people, while not neglecting your own your own responsibilities. Your family does come first. Mm -hmm. But that's feeding and clothing and housing your family, not necessarily the third trip to Disneyland this year. <laughs> right. and, and, and again, those are things you're going to have to answer to God for. And that, you know, I, I, I'm down on that third trip to Disneyland, but maybe that's me. Maybe under some circumstances, that is important. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And and God judges and not not me. And so that's a wonderful thing. The freedom, the personal freedom here. Now, um, the enemies of freedom will say, but if you trust people to do that, they won't give anything. It's amazing how <laughs> liberals who in theory believe in the goodness of the human heart suddenly mistrust it when it comes to us leaving them, leaving the ordinary citizen to 
dole out his money as he will. <laughs> then suddenly the common guy is greedy and a capitalist and, and what's the wonderful opening line for Scrooge grasping covetous old oh, sin and yes. you know that. <laughs> Scraping um, something. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Bible does not assume that human nature is good, but it does assume that where God's people are covenanted together in a society and God's spirit is at work and the gospel is being preached, there is going to be a general trend toward giving stuff to people who actually need it. And, and we can trust them. We can trust, we can trust freedom. We can trust God's people with freedom. And we can even trust people who are not covenantally committed to, to God, but are living within the sphere of their society happily by choice, that even they might do some good things. And so you go to your unconverted neighbor and say, I'm collecting for this charity. And it's amazing how many times they'll write a check. And sometimes a bigger check than the Christian neighbor wrote mm -hmm. because of the over, and this is where common grace properly understood comes in. This is the overflow of the effects of the gospel. As people learn there's something beyond me and being nice is one of them and I want to be nice and I may not be, and it may be a self-help kind of gospel they're living out and yet it does produce a certain kind of outward charity. And that's a good thing. Anyway, that was just, that's the first step. That's the, <laughs> um, that's the private loan. Also, the, if you want the quote about Scrooge, I pulled it up. Oh, yes. I love, I love the words. It, he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which, from which no steel had struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. <laughs> So and I've always wondered why he says oyster and not clam, but that's something else. Okay, there's our tribute <laughs> to the Christmas season in case it is, in case one does not become obvious someplace along the line here. But Christmas is open is over by the time people hear this. So well, New Year's, how many days are there of Christmas, Greg? Oh well, this is so. <laughs> Trivia: The twelve days of Christmas begin when? December twenty fifth. When they begin on Christmas. They that's the first in, day. You just the get the partridge day. that day. Yeah. Yes. All you do is yeah partridge. Why partridge? I will never know. So that's- It ends that's, on Epiphany on January 6th. Okay. We'll have to talk about Epiphany sometime. Most mm -hmm. people have no idea what it is because we're Americans. We don't do that. Um, the second thing is the third year tithe. Well, both tithes together. Every um, year you were to tithe. And since it, uh, Egypt, Israel was an agricultural society, it generally wasn't every week for the farming community. It was at the end of each harvest, and they would take their tithes to the Feast of Tabernacles and tithe in. People who lived in cities and made their money elsewhere could tithe weekly as, as they chose. Um, under the New Covenant, Paul recommends laying aside every week as God has prospered, but doesn't set down a lot of tight regulations for how that works exactly. Uh, and, and, but one of the functions of the, the normal tithe was to help out people who had legitimate needs, the legitimate poor, the deserving poor. Uh, but the tithes were given to the elders, and so the elders would have oversight to just to make sure that you got your head screwed on right. And no, it doesn't go to your wayward daughter who is out carousing all night. No. Okay, yeah, them, you don't like him much, but you know what? God's working in him. We think we, we would like to be able to help him. And so you have Advice and oversight from your elders, one direction or another. Uh, it is interesting. And, sorry, this is a little bit of a side note, but mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Paul kind of shifts the focus to weekly, but then Paul is talking mostly to the Christians in particular cities, in particular cities rather yes. than people in the country, which ties into this whole theme of beginning in the garden and ending in the city. Yeah. And we'll yeah. thank you for reading. The, thank you for complicating it yet again. There's more yep, here that I realize going in. So <laughs> remember to get us back on that because we do have to talk about how this is. This is a uh, the gleaning laws applied to the agricultural districts. They didn't apply to the city. anyway. Um, so there was that. But every third year, and, and, and this can be taken a number of ways. And I don't have a firm position. You can do what you want with it. In some fashion, either as a separate tithe or as a distinct use of the tithe of the third year, the tithe was dedicated to the poor, which meant that every third year, the deserving poor would get a shot in the arm. They get a windfall. It wasn't every year, though, which meant that 
you 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 get this you, you get a, a fairly large sum of money one assumes, but it's this year. Now we need forward thinking. We need future orientation. There are possibilities here. If I am literally incapable of working, and there's nothing I can do, you know, with just my hands and my mind, I can't. My body won't work. But I, I can't. Do, I really can't do anything. Then I need to parcel out that money over the course of three years. And that's going to take some planning and some self restraint, self control. I can't go out and binge it all, you know, buy a new TV and a new car, and then suddenly I have nothing for the next three years. On the other hand, if I am able to work and my poverty is not because of some debilitating illness or accident, but it's because of some temporary setback, I can now say, okay, three years. I can use this as capital and I can begin investing it in some kind of family business, something by some tools, by something with which I can earn more money. And again, the, the, the temptation will be, wow, I got a lot of money from the government. I got a stimulus check. I can just spend it all right now and it stimulate the economy and do good to all people. No, that's not, this is not how this is supposed to work. So there is a call here again to future orientation, hard work, planning and thinking, maturity, as so much of this is, because next year you're not going to get that special handout. So you have to think ahead. And of course, the basic charity in all of this that I skipped over is that of family. Paul says that if a man provide not for, or actually it's not even masculine, if anyone will uh, not provide for his own. He's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And in the context there, it's actually talking about grandchildren uh, taking care of the grandparents, mm. although the application is much broader, of course. Uh, but it's basically, if there are widows, let their family take care of them. They have sons or grandsons, nephews, the King James says. Um, that charity begins at home, most literally. It is, if they are church members, you are to require it of them. And that goes first. And then the church, and then the final step in the New Covenant, the church takes up for those who are widows indeed, Paul calls them. And he has a detailed list of virtues and, and, and track history that these widows have to conform to. They have to have served God. They have to have been full of good works and hospitality. Uh, they have to be seeking God with prayers. Um, and then the church can, in such extreme cases where there is absolutely no one else to take care of them, the church can put them on the roll. There was an office or status of widow in the church where the church paid everything. Um, but Paul is very, sets, sets some hard restraints on it, like an age restraint and the admonition that if you can't get married, get married. This, <laughs> is, this is for those who are truly, truly destitute. Mm -hmm. So Christianity and Judaism before, biblical Judaism, does have a, a, a lot in place that we would consider a welfare system. But of course, the thing that uh, is absent is any kind of government coercion, government planning, government oversight, government here meaning state. There's family government, church government is involved to some extent, but the first line is self-government, stewardship of one's own property, and then the broader concept of family government, where you take care of your own and then you share what your family has earned with those who are in, in true need. Paul sums up, uh, the commandment thou shalt not steal is let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands the thing that is good that he may have to him to give to him that needeth. So thou shalt not steal, according to Paul, means one, stop stealing. <laughs> that would be <laughs> the obvious part. <laughs> <laughs> and we often stop there, but stop stealing, work hard with your hands and your mind, whatever else. And then so that you may have, and when I'm, I'm teaching this, often students will miss that part. They'll jump to, so you can give it to. Well, there's something in between there. You have to have it. You have to have not blown it all on wine, women, and song, or whatever, or your favorite <laughs> hobby. Or uh, buying your parents a house. Yeah. You, know? you, know, like you can't the, just. <laughs> you, yeah. It's not there just to spend and make comfortable people more comfortable, including yourself. Right. It is there in part to share with people who need it. And, and again, Oftentimes, our liberal friends are correct in their criticism of people who adopt a capitalist mentality. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm distinguishing a capitalist mentality as we know it from capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system. 
Of course, it does not, not does not provide for the poor. It is a description <laughs> of how the market works. <laughs> right. <laughs> Providing for the poor is not part of the market as such. It takes the gospel to move people to provide for the poor. So trying to stretch capitalism to be a religion is a mistake of mm -hmm. huge proportions, as is stretching socialism to be a religion, but that kind of comes with the territory. Uh, they, they <laughs> That's try much to, less of a stretch. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they try, their basic assumption is that the economic situation will change people's hearts and lives and thus mm -hmm. their giving habits or spending habits or whatever. Whereas Christianity says, no, describing the market is not the same thing as telling you how you ought to live. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's these are two. As long as we keep the things distinct and realize, yes, you earned this. That does not mean that it is yours absolutely. God gave it to you. God owns it, and God can tell you what to do with it. And, and that, until you, go ahead, um, that future orientation applies here also. So it's not just to those who are in need and have to budget the the pennies that they have. It's you don't know how God is going to give you opportunity to bless other people in the future. So be prepared for when that opportunity arises. Ooh, yes. Ouch. Exactly. That is part of this whole thing. Now, I, I may have left out something. If you can think of something, let, uh, jump in. But we've talked about the family. We've talked about the tithe and the third year tithe. We've talked about gleaning. We've talked about um, zero interest charity loans. Uh, these were to cover basic necessities so that someone could either feed himself or get the necessary capital to start feeding himself and his family. Notice all the things that today welfare in the broad sense covers that aren't here. There's nothing here specifically about medicine, except insofar as you might want to use some of this medicine to get well so you can go work. Mm -hmm. Or the Someone's medicinal dying, quality of actually eating yeah. good food. <laughs> yeah, uh, and all that. There's nothing here about education. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was no centralized educational system in Israel any more than there was a centralized um, medical program. These were things that were either matters, extensions of a, fam a family life, functions of family. Uh, you know, mom teaches the kids at home, and when they reach a certain age, you send them to the rabbi to learn the Torah properly. Um, or maybe you have an uncle or an aunt or a grandmother, or maybe you get together a co-op of people. Uh, or there were this, there were the um, the rabbinical schools. You, you went to, to turn out scholars. Well, send them to other scholars. So there, there were all kinds of choices, but they were all free market. And so our libertarian friends should applaud that one. <laughs> <clears throat> and the same thing with medicine. Nothing mm -hmm. that told you how to go about that. Uh, There's just some restrictions on poisoning. <clears throat> yeah, no, your poisoning is out. Um, mm -hmm. So you should know what you're doing with your drugs. But Jesus does say, to the consternation of many, I suspect, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus acknowledged that doctors are a thing and at least potentially a good thing, and you may actually need one, but he doesn't say that therefore the state should provide one because this is a real and genuine need. It's not a state function any more than education is a state function, no more than welfare is a state function. Um, now, we're, at this point, we're talking about Old Covenant life, and um, we, this is maybe the point to, to shift gears a little. Um, but let, let, let me sum up. So he, here are things that Israel did and things Israel did not do. And the underlying principles of it's all God's stuff. God should work in you a willing heart. Therefore, you should prepare to be willing and to give wisely. Uh, if you are in, in poverty, you should be willing to receive responsibly and plan ahead and try not to stay in poverty. You should try to pay off loans and such. And you should be willing and, and, and desirous of working rather than, re rather than receiving handouts if you can. And the Bible recognizes that sometimes you can't. And begging was a legitimate thing uh, in Israel, but Generally, beggars would be known to the elders of the gates, and they would, I don't know if there was an official license. I think there was by Jesus' time. But we're not told how that worked. Because again, small communities, people would know, the elders would know. Yeah, that's Sam. He could work just fine. He just, he has a bad back every Thursday, you know. Um, it's funny that of, I think all the beggars that I can think of in the New Testament, they were mostly, they couldn't walk. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. They yeah, weren't we're not, just there because they had nothing to do. Yeah. We're not told about Lazarus specifically, but I think given Abraham's appraisal of him, we can assume that he was physically incapable of caring for himself. So even begging can be a thing. Put it, again, like as the church put widows on its rolls mm -hmm. and paid completely for them, you got a godly beggar who really honestly can't do anything. He's going to still ask to be in church, synagogue, every every Sabbath day. People are going to arrange for people, and the church is going to arrange to get him there. So you know this guy, and you know his needs are legitimate. Again, we're back on personal knowledge, personal responsibility. And so those are things that carry over pretty easily. However, as we said, gleaning is something that worked in the agricultural parts of Israel. It didn't work in the cities, nor is there any requirement for the cities to find some form of imitation. Although it's possible, when goodwill originally started out in American society, the goal, and I don't know to what degree it still does this, but the goal was go collect people's castoffs and let disabled people work on them and repair them so they would they would actually be working. You were, you were gleaning off people's stuff and people would actually work and out of that would come both money for themselves and money to perpetuate the program. And that's kind of uh, of a gleaning. Some of, there were, there are records of immigrants who came to America having nothing and their first thought was, America is so rich, look at all their junk they just throw out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start collecting it. Wait, they appreciate me taking it away. I will now charge them for collecting it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we think of garbage collectors sometimes as, as as a low calling, but it's not. I mean, you know what happens. And it pays around. very well. <laughs> yeah, it pays very well because most people don't think they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, with trucks that do all the work for you, you know, when, when I was a kid, trucks didn't do all that much. And we had big, beefy kind of guys who would get out and they would pick up those trash cans and they would sling them up into the, the maw of the, of the truck's back and flip the switch and do the crunching. Now, the guy should sit in the truck and kind of look at and punch some buttons, which is fine, you know. But we, we're not inclined to think of this as a profitable and sometimes not even as a respectable uh, occupation. But it most certainly is because, you know, what happens when we have garbage strikes in, say, New York or Chicago or even Sacramento. It gets real gross real It fast. gets real gross real fast. And suddenly we find out how important these people are mm -hmm. to the happiness and cleanness of our daily lives. But it was not something that Americans with their um, all of their stuff were quick to adopt. So foreigners, immigrants came in and did it. And some of them got really rich off of it. Mm -hmm. So that's something you could do. But practically, in terms of what the law actually says, since there was no requirement for that, no particular incentive to do that, the place to be would be on the farm. So in this sense, rather than the cities as they have from the time of Rome, perhaps earlier or onward, drawing people to the cities where there are bread and circuses, uh, Israel's policy would push them back out of the fields where there's hard work. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the Old Covenant. And when we come to the New Covenant, there's nothing said specifically about this kind of thing. And as you say, Paul wrote mostly to cities, churches in big cities. And he talks about taking care of widows, <clears throat> but he does not specify even in passing or an illusion anything about gleaning. So yeah, the closest thing might be you shall not muzzle the ox while he is treading out the grain. <laughs> yeah, and that's you know, pay that's people. Just pay people do. for the work they do. Here's something I wrote that maybe fits in here. The gleaning system, however, operated only in the countryside. There was no corresponding system for Israel's cities. The net effect would have been to drive the most desperately poor out of the cities and into the fields. This reinforced Israel's tribal arrangement of land and the promised land, together with its tribal divisions, played a key role in the promise of Messiah. The promised land was Emmanuel's land. And quoting from Gary North, thus the gleaning law was part of the social order associated with Old Covenant Israel. It reinforced the tribal system. It also reinforced rural life at the expense of urban life, one of the few mosaic laws to do so. God is no longer concerned with the location and distribution and separation of the tribes of Israel because Emmanuel has come. And so any attempt to cut and paste is, is kind of beside the point. We, mm -hmm. we aren't an agricultural society. You know, the, it would have been interesting to look ahead and see how many farmers there are now versus how many farmers there were 100 years ago. In fact, I've heard the statistics within the last week. I think one of my girls maybe was doing a paper on it or something. The change is significant. We, have, uh, we, we don't need as many farmers 
because of improvements in technology and farming. Mm -hmm. But we still need food. We still need farms. Yep. <laughs> um, but the shift has been, as you say, away from the garden toward the city. Uh, and But God kind of held that back in the Old Covenant. But when we get to the New Covenant, the, the emphasis uh, throughout the Gospels and even in Jesus, Jesus goes from village to village and town to town. He, unlike John, the last of the Old Testament prophets, who goes out in the wilderness and calls people to him, Jesus goes to the people in their towns and villages. And the apostles go to major cities. And most of the cities they go to, we still know about today. We Some of them still survive, like Rome. Some of them we have the archaeological ruins of. We, we know these were big cities. So they, they, they moved toward uh, populated, cultivated, civilized, uh, economically developed areas as the gospel expanded. So to cut and paste is not the ideal, but understanding the underlying principles is. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have a, a, a list here, and you can see if I missed something. The poor, even the deserving poor, don't have a legal claim on anyone else's property. God's law doesn't give the state the authority to redistribute wealth, that is steal from taxpayers, in order to alleviate poverty. Charity works best where the one who gives knows the character and needs of the one who receives. The best sort of a welfare program is one that allows and requires the deserving poor to work for their food or money and rewards them according to their diligence. Farmers and urban businessmen would do well to see how they might make their unused resources available for modern forms of cleaning. Notice the tentativeness there. And those who give to the poor should discriminate on the basis of moral character, not ethnicity or national origin. Is there anything there that I've missed that you want to talk about? I had thoughts as you were going through them, but I don't think they are as central principles. <laughs> they were just sort of commentary. So, Well, that's all right. But I, I, I've I, said the phrase deserving poor. I need to, we need to talk about deserving poor, especially yeah. since my fair lady gives an entire section to it. <laughs> we um, are running out of time, however. Do you okay, want well, to I'll, stretch this into another episode or? <laughs> no, this, this should yeah. go fast. Deserving poor means people who want to work and who have mm -hmm. real needs, not people who don't want to work and want a lot of drugs and alcohol. And uh, Eliza's father in My Fair Lady complains, I'm the undeserving poor, but I still have the same needs and wants as everyone else. And, yeah, well, you're dealing with a God who has a, sta has a sense of a standard nature of holiness and justice. And, then and finally, it takes that humility to be willing to submit your life to the judgment of someone else to determine yes. whether you are diligent and honest and upright and hardworking. Yeah. So back to this issue of immigration then. In Israel, you could come from another country. In, in Ruth's case, she had married into Israel, so legally was entitled to more than others, although, again, there might be the local prejudices. But by her faith and hard work, she overcame those prejudices by and large. But you could come um, and you could, uh, you could conceivably buy a house in a town. You could certainly rent one. You could, you could rent and lease property out in the fields, but because of the Jubilee laws, you could not buy land. Uh, you could buy it for a time, which we would call leasing, but in the Jubilee, it would, it would revert. Uh, you could become an Israelite by circumcision, attending the three feasts, three required feasts, and by uh, pledging to fight the militia as needed, with a couple of exceptions. Edomites and Egyptians took thir three generations before they were allowed to hold office, what we would call hold office or exercise governmental function, vote in Israel, because there's a recognition here that culture matters and that you just because you're here doesn't mean you get the nature, the culture of this covenant of society. So just as the church does not ordain novices and does not even necessarily ordain somebody who came to Christ late in life and is trying to figure it all out, we, we wait and ordain those who have shown themselves mature in the faith and, and settled and not given to weirdness. Uh, the Bible seems to say it's okay to do that kind of thing politically, too. You, you, you've got a culture. The United States does this to a limited extent. We expect mm -hmm. new immigrants to go through citizenship classes. And, and, and some, many come out understanding American history and culture far better, at least they used to, far better than the products of our public school system. Right. We can think of 12 Angry Men and the... Uh, the uh, Apparently, he's a Czech. He sounds Italian uh, immigrant who 
talks about the, the, the glories of being able to be on a jury and mm-hmm. all that. So you, you, there were many things you could do. If you were adopted into a tribe, then you could own land because you might inherit it as part of the tribal system or at the Jubilee. So there were restrictions on what coming in meant. You could be there, a God-fearer and a foreigner, a stranger, recognized as such, and do business and profit and grow rich and be protected by the equal laws that governed Israel without ever actually becoming someone who could, what we would call, vote or hold office. But those were possibilities open to you, if not in your generation, then perhaps three generations later. And there's uh, assumption that everyone understands what it means to be in Israel versus out of Israel. This right. is not an absence of borders. There's a right. very clear definition of who's in and who's not. Oh, absolutely. The Promised mm-hmm. Land had very distinct borders. Yeah. And Israel was was authorized to defend her borders mm-hmm. from outside assailants, including roving bandits and such. But anybody could come across and trade and leave. Um, anyone could come across and stay if they could find a place to stay, but they were required to submit to the laws. They didn't get to do whatever they wanted, uh, and exile was a possibility if you if you violated Israel's laws. But by coming, you did not get government welfare, you did not get government education, you did not get government health policies. You had to work, but you had the freedom to do it. Yeah. So this this is what we can hold up at least as the beginnings of a model for immigration and welfare in these United States. Uh, We're not anywhere near ready to do it. But as showing people, yes, the libertarians have some right ideas. The liberals have some compassionate compassion or something, or they think they do, but (laughs) some of them really do, you know. But simply feeling compassion is not the same thing as doing the compassionate thing. The tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And so we have to consider what God considers to be merciful. And sometimes sometimes that means working really hard and sweating and doing without. And enforcing justice. And enforcing justice. Yeah. Well, it's difficult to stop there, but (laughs) we have to stop sometime. So do we have any recommendations to wrap up? I have well, one. I can all right, first go first if you want. All right. I'm going to recommend an app called You Need a Budget, Y-N-A-B. Ah. One of the things I do on the side is financial coaching, which is not telling people which investments to buy or anything like that. It's just walking alongside people and helping them figure out their budget and their goals <laughs> and how that works. And my favorite tool for this, they don't pay me. I kind of wish they would because I really am a fan. uh, My favorite tool is the app, You Need a Budget. Um, It's great, especially if you are married and need a convenient way to communicate about money with your spouse. Um, Because it's electronic, you can each have access to where dollars are. And one of the best strengths of this app is that it's not retrospective, like say Mint, which is not my favorite app by a long shot. But it's very popular. But the the idea of Mint is, oh, you can look back and see where all of your money went. And YNAB is much more about telling your money where to go. (laughs) It's putting dollars that you already have into categories um, so that you can be working towards your goals. So I really recommend YNAB. It's not free. It's like, I think it works out to something like $5 a month, but we've found it very worth it in our family. Uh, E. Calvin Beisner, years ago now although he's updated it, wrote a book called Prosperity and Poverty, The Compassionate Use of Resources in a World of Scarcity. It's a wonderful book. It's a book that if we could afford it, we would use as a textbook in our school Mm -hmm. instead of simply capitalistically borrowed um, a lot of what he's done. Of course, he's hardly original. He's also borrowed with credit from a lot of writers who I know. He's one of the few who gives uh, a tip of the hat to people like uh, R.J. Rush Jr. and Gary North saying, I don't buy into their whole system, but here are some points where they're looking at biblical law and it's there's some stuff to learn here. So I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it, compassionate use of resources. He's He understands it's not all about how I get to keep my money and you don't get any of it, but how God blesses us so that we can bless others. And it's it's written, I would say, at about a college level. Um, although some of my students have been able to wrestle with it and profit from it. And he has written a number of other books 
uh, along these lines, which you may find. A blessing. He's a professor at uh, Covenant College. Hmm. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a left turn from bo- both of those genres of recommendations and recommend politically a- left or <laughs> no a, uh, <laughs> recommend a YouTube channel uh, that talks about it, it, it's a cooking channel basically oh, this yeah. uh, guy named Ethan Chablowski which it'll be in the show notes I don't feel like spelling it right now uh, <laughs> but it is it actually is C-H-L-E-B-O-W-S-K-I I ended up binging Whoa. a bunch of his episodes this week because I had free time and I was very excited to do some of the things he suggests regarding meal planning and uh, also just very fun kinds of recipes like um, braised short ribs as a weeknight reheated meal mm. and um, pierogies um, mm. from scratch. So uh, if, for those who don't know, pierogies are, uh, I think, Polish versions of dumplings so they're oh, delicious okay. like all dumplings are so uh that's my recommendation uh he also gives like really basic nutrition breakdowns of like the nutrients and and um uh stats for so like carbohydrates and and fats and all that kind of stuff that goes onto a nutrition label when you buy it in the store but you can't <laughs> do that when you're making it yourself <laughs> mm, yeah uh, in particular, uh, one recipe that I'm excited to try is uh, risotto-style pasta, where mm. Mm. Uh, you just cook the pasta in a wok with a small amount of water and let the water absorb all the starch and reduce down into a sauce that you can then – well, a base for a sauce, basically. And then uh, add cheese and meat and vegetables and stuff and basically work it into something very yes that was my exact reaction watching the video greg (laughs) (laughs) i haven't had breakfast and now i am suddenly so hungry (laughs) okay yeah that sounds great well let's all stop and have a snack (laughs) sounds good (laughs) thank you guys so much for this conversation it's been a delight thanks also to david our producer and my lovely wedded husband thank you to our financial supporters we appreciate you keeping the show rolling if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Uh Please send us an email with any questions, comments, bouquets, brickbats. Uh, you can reach us at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Subscribe on YouTube, Rumble. We have a Facebook page. Talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>